Um, please come up here, uh, Yaman Chan. He is uh, someone who I've just had the pleasure of meeting, so he is going to be one of my friends. And his talk is from Mission School in Borneo via Survivor. And um, I'm sure you're going to give me some how to get my kid into MIT tips, yes? Maybe. OK, well, we should become friends, and then that'll happen. All right. OK, I'll give you the podium now. Thank you. May I? Thank you very much for having me here to, uh, uh, today. Uh, as you can see, uh, I do have a religion. It is against my religion to use PowerPoint, OK? Uh, I, I was actually going to have just one slide, and it was the map of Malaysia to show those of you who are geographically challenged where Borneo is. But since uh, Malaysian airline that has been missing has been in the news for uh, recently, you have seen the map of Malaysia over and over again. So you, you sort of know where, where Malaysia is. Uh, so the, the advantage of not using PowerPoint right, is that I can change my talk. Uh, and so while I have a prepare section, uh, after seeing the movie yesterday, you all saw the contradiction. Uh, I was so impressed that I want to make some changes in my starting up of my talk today. Uh, I have always, always wondered, you know, why the two most secular population in the U.S., Asians and Jews, the non-Hasidic, you know, non-Orthodox Jews, the, they are the most secular, by far, are the most successful economically, politically. They are getting up there, the, at least the Jewish population. The Asians in many private communities, or smaller communities. Uh, and yet, the most religious population, by far, are the African Americans. And I'm glad, and I've always wondered that, and I've talked to many people about that, uh, and I'll share with you some story of my survivor experience with some of the African Americans who were on the show with me. Uh, and I'm glad to see that somebody has finally addressed this question. And I hope that he's successful in getting his movie be shown to the general public. So, brothers and sisters, deep, deep in your pocket, dig deep in your pocket and help the man get his movie out there. Uh, the advantage of being uh, a speaker at the end and almost at the end of the conference is that I got to talk to quite a number of people. And I got to, to listen to many of the talks here. Uh, and there's a couple of things that, a couple of books that I wish were mentioned that is relevant to our cause of secular, secularism and atheism, uh, which I think is very important and which I will now mention. Those of you who are not anthropologists, there is a book by Jared Diamond. His first book was uh, uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, which is, which is not an anti-Mormon book, but any Mormon who read that book would probably realize there's something wrong with the Book of Mormon. His latest book, which I just recently read, uh, is called The World Until Yesterday. If you have not read it, read it. It talks about primitive culture that is in today's world that still exists. And you can, from that, from his nar narrative, get an idea of how religion still is thriving in some of these cultures and how many religions are born. A very, very interesting book. I highly recommend it. Uh, the other book that is, has just been published is by a fellow uh, person from Berkeley. It's called God Bless America by Karen Stolznow. S-T-O-L-L-Z-N-O-W. Karen Stolznow. It's just been published. It's called God Bless America. Uh, each chapter talks about a different French religion in America. She went and visited with these people. She 
hung out with them, and she wrote about them. Okay, very, very interesting. So I just want to leave, start with that uh, before I get into more interesting subject like Survivor. Uh, let me have a show of hands. Uh, any Chinese here? Couple. Japanese. Korean. <laughs> when I go to skeptic conferences, which I'm more involved with, uh, I am always disappointed to find how few Asians there are. And it always bothered me. Because in every research university in America and in most countries, there is just oodles of Asians. <laughs> And yet, when it comes to movements like this, they're absent. And I've always, you know, it, it bugged me, because to me, that is very important, as most Asians are really secular, but yet, they don't want to stick their head up to be pounded down, right? Don't rock the boat, is what we were taught. So if you have Asian friends, rock their boat. Tell them to get involved. <laughs> so I, I was... Uh, a kid in Borneo, which at that time was a British colony, and I attended a mission school. Now, this is how it works. Uh, when the uh, European colon colonial forces took over many countries, so they sort of divided up Africa badly, and we're seeing still the consequence of that. And in Asia, they divided it up a little bit better, right? So the French had the Indochina, you know, the, the Spanish had the Philippines, and the Dutch had you know, Indonesia, and so on. And the British had Mal uh, Borneo, part of Borneo. Uh, and so I was in what is called British North Borneo. And the way the colonial government worked is that they left the education to the missionaries. Okay? It, you, you can debate as to who came first, the missionaries or the colonies, colonial government came first. I think the missionaries came first and tamed the people and then the East Indies company came and traded and then took over the, gov and, and took over the whole place. Uh, the, the island, the northern part of the island, which is North Borneo, was sort of divided between the Anglicans and the Catholics. So I was in, the Angli in an Anglican school. I spent 12 years in an Anglican school steeped in religion. So I know the religion very well. Uh, in fact, but my family was Catholic. Now, and there was Catholic school. Now, my father went to a Catholic school in Hong Kong, uh, but he never wanted us to be in a Catholic school. He hated the, the Catholic school system, so he said, I don't want my kids to be under the system, so he put us in an Anglican school. So basically, at that time, if you were a kid growing up in the British, any British colony, you would have gone to a mission school. That's a, right? And so being a Catholic go, growing up in an Anglican school, I find, I, from the very young age, I saw sort of the difference. They said, wait a minute, you know, those guys and we, we believe in the same God, it's the same Bible almost, it's a little bit different. Uh, how come they told us, you know, I, my school tell us that they were wrong and when I go to church on Sunday, to the, they told, the, the priest would look at us and say, why aren't you going to Catholic school? Why are you over there? They're wrong. Uh, so I got both sides of the picture from the very early age. So, so in that sense, I was very fortunate. I was quite religious for a while. In fact. I would wake up really early and, and, and go to Sunday Mass every Sunday, uh, singing in the choir and all that, right? Uh, what is a kid supposed to do, right? That's where the social life is, right? Where's, where the cute girls are. So, <laughs> I went to school. I happened to be one of the good students there, right? And, and in the Asian culture, if you're a good student, right, you can get away with a lot. Uh, <laughs> Just in America, if you're a good athlete, you get away with a lot. Uh, because I was a good student, I was able to do a lot of things, like I was allowed to read a lot of other books that were outside the curriculum. 
Uh, I was able to go to the library and, and do my own thing. Uh, I was quite advanced, and I was very fortunate to be in a culture where that was appreciated. What tipped my interest in science and really convinced me that science is what I want to get into was the moon landing. I was in what is equivalent of, uh, we have to form, those of you who understand the British system, there's the primary one through uh, six, and then there's a form one, form two, and two form six. So uh, 12 years of, of schooling. It was form five, so it's the equivalent of uh, 11th grade, was the moon landing. We had no TV in Borneo at that time. The school, at least our class, stopped all work that day. Someone had a transistor radio, and we were tuned in to Voice of America all day, listening to the moon landing. That was quite an experience. I can still remember this. You know, one of our more artistic classmates was on the blackboard drawing the landing craft, like following the, you know, the little capsule and so on and landing. And so we were imagining how it look, would look like while listening to the radio. And to me, that was incredible. And that sort of really pounded in my head, I want to study science. And if I want to study science, where do you go? You go to America. They landed a man on the moon. Amazing, right? Of course. So now, remember, it was a British colony. In 1963, we gained independence. North Borneo, Sarawak, and Singapore and Malaya joined up and formed Malaysia. So Malaysia was born in 1963, the combination of all those little uh, states. Uh, 1965, Singapore left, and so Singapore is now an independent state. So we were under the British system for so long. Uh, if you ever visit Malaysia, everybody sp still speak English. The street signs and everything is still in English. Uh, and so British, everyone, when they go for higher education, we didn't have a university at that time. You go to United Kingdom or you go to Australia. Nobody goes to the U.S. Nobody knows about the U.S., right? So I decided to go to the U.S. I said, no, I'm going to study physics. I'm going to study science. I'm going to the U.S. So I have no idea about U.S. education. So I went to a, we had, in my part of the, the country, there was no U.S. embassy. So I, the, the closest to U.S. anything is the local Peace Corps office. So, I, yeah. I went to the Peace Corps office and talked to them about, oh, I want to go to school in the U.S. And so they got me some material, and I talked to some of the people there. I keep bugging them, and they told me about schools that are good in science, right? Caltech, MIT, so what else? Uh, there was few, like Berkeley. So I applied to all of them, right? And I got into MIT. I don't know how, but anyway, so that's how I ended up in MIT. Uh, Great time there. I studied physics, uh, high energy physics, and for graduate school, I went to uh, University of California at Santa Barbara. And when I graduated from there, I, I had my first job in, at University of Colorado. I worked for the Joint Institute for Laboratory Astrophysics, uh, which is part of the National Bureau of Standards at that time. And from then, uh, UC Berkeley recruited me, and I came over uh, to University of California at Berkeley and spent the last 30 years with them. And I retired from UC Berkeley last summer. So I'm now a man of leisure, sort of. <laughs> uh, now, somewhere down, along the line, now remember, all my life in the US, I have worked with universities, in universities, in research environment. So I, I've led a very sheltered life, so to speak. So in 2007, I ended up on the show, CBS show, Survivor. What an experience, right? Amazing. So, and I did quite well. Uh, those of you who saw the show know that, you know, I use my science background to be able to win some challenges and to be able to impress them. Uh, 
but I never made a big deal out of the fact that I'm not a believer. So somewhere between in college years, I sort of shared my belief. It was, it was a gentle thing. There was no traumatic experience where, you know, I just say, oh, I don't believe anymore. It, was, it just slowly faded away. And I'm comfortable with that. I'm, I'm not, you know, going out and telling everybody I'm atheist and, 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 and uh, telling everybody not to believe. So, you know, so when I went on to show Survivor, I've already not a believer. I've been a believer for at least 15, 20 years. Uh, on the show Survivor, it was great experience, horrible condition. Those of you who, who watched the show, and I'm sure uh, I'm taking questions, so I'm going to finish a little bit early and, and be able to take questions. Okay. The, the important thing about Survivor that you need to know is that it's a lot more horrible than you see on TV. <laughs> a lot more, okay? And so I, I never made a big deal of it, and it wasn't an issue. And, and it wasn't an issue for me either whether I should be out or not. However, when I came back from the Survivor show, I had an opportunity, because of being on, on Survivor, to travel this country to make appearances because of Survivor. I also made a trip to Afghanistan to entertain the troops. So when I start traveling this country and, and happen to be around the Deep South, I found out that there are people who actually believe that the Earth is 6,000 years old, okay? <laughs> and it wasn't a joke. Now, I've, I've heard of that, but I thought it was a joke. I thought it was just one of those bad jokes, right? I, I actually ended up talking to people, professionals, police officers, okay? People who act, I, I just mind-boggling, right? I, I came to the U.S. because you landed a man on the moon, and I'm talking to a bunch of people, adults, People with responsibility, firefighters, who believe the Earth is 6,000 years old. You go, WTF. Uh, <laughs> that, that was when I started being very, getting active, uh, mostly with the uh, skeptics community. Uh, and when all the other stuff like homeopathy and alternative medicines comes up and so on. So, I, you know, with my science background, I help these organizations, you know, write about it and, and, and deal with them. Uh, but still, it's, it's not, you know, a big deal for me. The religious part of it, yeah, I don't believe, but nobody ever confronted me about my belief system. Uh, they know I'm, you know, pretty hard nose about when someone talk about, you know, acupuncture and all that. Hey, you know, show me a well-run study to show it works, I'll go along with it. Uh, so, I'm on Facebook and uh, I have about 4,000 friends, most of whom I have not met, right? <laughs> and, and, and nobody cared, I don't, you know, I don't troll people about their belief. I mean, yeah, I get all these things, oh, pray for me, you know, my dog is sick and all that, right? And, and you really want to say, oh, why, okay? But, but I don't, okay? Until about four years ago, right, when something outed me. And once I'm outed, I get so many. They don't want to unfriend me because they want to be a friend with a survivor. Okay, that's a big deal. Uh, but I get a lot of inbox messages and you know, indignation about things I say. Uh, so the, the thing that outed me, four years ago, my older daughter turned 21. And for her birthday message, I wrote a note to her. And in that note, I posted it on the website, uh, uh, on my Facebook, and when many of my friends who are more religious read it, figured out where my head is at. <laughs> so I will read you the note. And you can see that it's very mild, but still, the message is clear. This is my note to my daughter when she turned 21. On this, your 21st orbit around our sun, please allow mom and I to give you one last advice before you launch yourself into adulthood. You may just be one of six billion bipedal, hairless primates on this little blue dot we call home circulating a minor star of a small solar system in a mediocre galaxy in a far corner of our universe. But you are very, very special to us. 
as you strive to reach for your own star and navigate your own way around this universe, remember to be creative. Honor your urge to express yourself. Consider the healing power and life-affirming influence of art, music, and reading great literature. Spend time with people who share your values and interests and who are supportive of you and encourage you to be who you are. Surround yourself with friends who respect your rights to feel and think for yourself. If you care to have a spiritual interest in your life, let your belief be chosen and not indoctrinated or coerced. You are not a sheep in anybody's flock. Allow yourself to consider a wide range of ideas and develop the practice that works best for you. There is profound meaning to life. You have to find it for yourself. If someone tells you he or she has the only answer to the meaning of life and to all of life's problems, turn and run the other way. <laughs> Learning is a lifelong process. Read the works of men and women of letters of yesterday and today. Keep up with the current development in science and it will deepen your appreciation of the wonders of this universe. Whatever is ahead of you, you know, we know you will undertake with grace and style. Life will be a journey that will have its share of struggles and setbacks, as well as triumphs and glories. Take time out to look back and see that these are simply threats to weave an ever richer tapestry, the design of which is uniquely yours. It is your life. Remember humor. Remember humor. Enjoy the moments when everything comes together and learn to laugh when things fall apart and everything seems to be ridiculous. So in that note to her, I never mentioned God. It was very obvious where my head is at. <laughs> All right. So anyway, so I start getting inboxes and go, are you atheist? I go, what do you think? <laughs> so I, I would, I'm told I should start taking questions from now. Oh, yeah, no, the, the first few trips uh, to, to some of these uh, rallies, uh, you know, meet, meet the star, meet, meet the, the survivor thing, uh, you know, when, when that part of the conversation comes up, my jaw drops. I mean, really, I mean, and, and people thought I was being snooty uh, when I said, uh, I, I don't know what to say. Uh, I, I really didn't. I mean, it, to me, it was so just out of context with my... You know, because as I said, I, I, I led a very sheltered life. Uh, you know, I read a lot about the sciences, and, and, and I'm around people who, who really understand how the universe works. And then suddenly there are people who tell me, you know, wait, the flood is real, and, you know, wow. <laughs> there was a question there. I enjoyed so much watching you, and thank you for representing us very well on wherever you were. I forget exactly where you I were. I was in Fiji, yeah. Thank you. So I've always wondered, I know that you have limited things with you on the island, but what exactly are you allowed to take with you? How many clothes? Do you get to change? Is there any? OK. We are allowed it one pair of underwear. One pair of socks, one pair of shoes, uh, one T-shirt, one long sleeve shirt, and one long pants. That's it. We 
were not allowed in any toiletry. So when you see the show and you see some couple smooching, you go, you, they haven't brushed the teeth for three weeks. <laughs> uh, well, whatever turns them on, I guess. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm a physics student at UCI, and I'm also part of the Secular Student Alliance there. And I've noticed I'm one of the only two Asians out of about 30 people. So what do you think is the cause of a lot of Asians who are secular, atheist, agnostic, and they just don't seem to care? Uh, the question is, uh, at UCI at least, the Asian students who are secular are not participating in those activities. And, and that is pretty much, uh, I can speak for the Chinese, uh, Koreans, and Japanese, right? We are brought up in a culture where you're told to not rock the boat, right? So if the dominant culture is religious and you're not, uh, keep your heads down, okay? Uh, and, and that is reinforced by the family. So it, it's, we're brought to, pe uh, to, to appease everybody. We're brought up to, you know, to make everybody happy. You know, the, the battle cry of your parents is, make your ancestors proud, right? Uh, rocking the boat did not make your ancestors proud. Uh, and so having, in, in a dominant culture that is very religious, when you stand up and say, I'm not religious, I don't believe in this crap, it ain't gonna go over well, right? Even if your parents are, are not religious, right? Because then you are being confrontational with, with, with the mainstream culture, uh, and being confrontational is a bad thing, right? Uh, notice we, you know, when someone asks you to do something, you don't ever say no, right? You can find excuses, but you don't say, no, hell no, I won't do it, right? I like my black sisters, okay? hell no, right? Uh, we don't ever say that. We were taught not to say that. And that's the problem. That, that's where, you know, even it's like, uh, I can relate that to skepticism, to alternative medicine. I mean, you go to a Chinese uh, herbal medicine store in San Francisco, Chinatown, any Chinatown, right? Look into the case. They're still selling dry, sealed penis, right? Tiger bones, okay? Uh, like, don't we know that doesn't work? And I've talked to chemistry professors, Chinese chemistry professors, I said, why did you help us? You know, it's like, but they don't want to, right? It's like, yeah, you know, I still have living parents. I, you know, it's like, t just come on. <laughs> yeah. go to the middle here. Okay. Uh, the, the first one is The World Until Yesterday, Jared Diamond, and God Bless America. God Bless America was just published about two months ago. I happen to know the author, that's why. And the author is Karen, K-A-R-E-N, Stolzno, S-T-O-L-L-Z-N-O-W. Uh, uh, God Bless America is a book that you can read. Uh, you don't have to read from top to bottom. Every chapter is a different religious organization. It, it, it's, it, they're extremes, right? They, he talked about the fundamentalist Mormon church. He talk, she talked about the, the Amish, the different variations of Amish. Which, I mean, these are all yeah, very, very well researched and, and very well done. So are your parents, uh, were your parents still alive when you? My, my mom was still alive at that time, yes. And how did she feel about your religion? Well, like, like a good Chinese mom, she says, make me proud, okay? So, yeah, uh, her fear, of course, is that I will embarrass her, right? And that's why uh, if you're Asian, uh, very few Asians apply to the show. So when the producers found me, an older Asian, they always, very few older people apply to these shows, right? And very few Asians. So with an older Asian, they got two for one. I think we can do one last question, and gentlemen in the orange, one moment. Um, given what you've explained about the general um, idea of keeping your head down in the Asian community, how would you suggest that the atheist community try and uh, bring those people out and get them to join our, our movement or our groups? Uh, uh, the, the way to have them join is I think if, if you involve them in a lot less aggressive activities, 
uh, where their names don't, don't show up in newspapers and so on, <laughs> you get a much better chance. Uh, so any activities, so if you organize secular uh, student activities and so on and, and involve them in you know, non-confrontational things, I mean if you go picketing you know, like uh, the secular, like the skeptic movement and we go you know, have this you know, suicide whatever, the 1023 campaign where we go taking overdose of homeopathic uh, sleeping pills, you're not going to get many Chinese to come on, right, even though they know it is. So uh, you have to be sensitive to that part of the culture, right. I, I'm the anomaly. I don't know what went wrong with me. I got dropped my head and I, you know, it's like my mom just like, I, they were very enlightened when, you know, for, for Chinese moms that they let me do things. Uh, and so they got complaints. I mean, so the complaints never to me. It's like my mom hear about it, right? Oh, your son, you know, argue with the teacher about this. Well, why do you talk to me about it, right? No, they go tell my mom about it. And even as adult, right? Uh, when I was on Survivor and, and I, w I got interviewed by Chinese newspapers and so on, and I always put in a jab for this Chinese medicine crap, okay? Uh, and, you know, my mom got the static, <laughs> not me. So, that's how it goes. Thank you.